Hello YouTube and welcome to What The Math. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at this beautiful gas giant called Jupiter. And uh, one of the comments someone suggested that I try to terraform one of the satellites. And specifically they were talking about Titan which is around Saturn. But I figured let's actually start with Jupiter because it does have more interesting satellites. And it's a slightly bigger gas giant that has slightly more things to offer to us. So this is Jupiter and uh, it currently has not currently has, but we currently know that it has at least 67 confirmed satellites or moons orbiting around it. Most of them are really tiny, like this one here, for example, Megaclite is only 2.7 kilometers, so basically you could call them um, captured asteroids more so than, than satellites, but they're still considered to be moons, so there's quite a lot of them, they all have different names, and they're all kind of funky. But the main ones are right here in the middle, there's actually only 8 of them, and we refer to them as regular satellites. So there's actually uh, four big ones on the outskirts and there's four smaller ones very, very close to Jupiter. Now the closest one is right here. This is Matis and it's actually tidally locked to Jupiter, meaning that it spins as it rotates around Jupiter. And it's also not a circular or not a spherical um, satellite. It's actually shaped really, really strangely. And uh, its radius is about its radius is about 21 kilometers actually for some reason in this game it's 69,000 kilometers I think this is actually a mistake uh, hopefully someone sees this and changes it because it's not that big this is this makes it much bigger than the earth so it's about 21 kilometers the second one is a little bit farther away and it's right here it's called Adrastea which uh, which is basically it was a, I believe it was a, a mother god in uh, Roman mythology or Greek mythology and uh, a lot of the uh, satellites of Jupiter are named after Greek and Roman gods. So this one is also quite small, it's at 8 kilometers uh, of radius and this is I believe the correct value and it's also tidally locked as well, like you can't really see it right now because we can't see Jupiter but there you go, it's actually tidally locked. The interesting thing about this satellite is that it's actually and it actually orbits slightly faster than the day on Jupiter which is very unusual. So basically it, uh, it kind of flies around Jupiter slightly faster than uh, what a day on Jupiter would be. And the other thing is that it's actually located inside the ring of, rings of Jupiter, so unlike uh, common perception, there's actually rings around Jupiter as well. Actually, all gas giants have rings, not just Saturn. It just Saturn uh, happens to have the biggest of the rings. Here, you don't really see it, but it, there's actually, supposedly, there's a, a, a ring of asteroids or ring of rocks around Jupiter. and. Um, Adrastea is actually one of the bigger ones and also was formed from them. The next one is Amalthea and this one is much bigger, it's at 83 kilometer radius and it's also in the same region as the other um, smaller uh, satellites, regular satellites of Jupiter. And this one is also, um, it's known that it's a little bit red in color and it's actually known why it's red in color but that's a fact about it that we know. And the less smaller satellite that's considered to be a regular satellite and it's also slightly red in color is right here and this is Thebe, um, also named after Roman Greek mythology gods and basically it's no different from the other satellites. It's possibly formed from the rings of Sat um, from the rings of Jupiter and it's about 49 kilometers in radius. But the more interesting moons of Jupiter and basically the ones we'll be talking about and looking at uh, in more detail are the so-called Galilean moons because they were actually discovered by Galileo a long, long time ago using his awesome 30x telescope. So there are four of them and they are this beautiful one which is probably my favorite and this is Io. This is the so-called volcanic satellite but basically it's uh, it's just basically a very very hot planet that is um, covered in volcanoes. There's really lots of volcanic activity on it, there's a lot of um, earthquakes and this is technically all just uh, really really hot lava that was uh, formed and reformed throughout the ages. And from what we know about it, there's at least 400 active volcanoes and actually some of the mountains that were formed by those volcanoes are even taller than, uh, than Everest. So Mount Everest is the tallest mountain that we have, but Ayo has mountains that are even taller than that. Uh, the second Galilean moon or satellite is called Europa and this one is actually very interesting because for one, it's uh, it's very very smooth. It, it's almost the opposite of Io because it doesn't really have that many mountainous features, even though its atmosphere is very very thin, and it does have some oxygen in the atmosphere. It's actually mostly oxygen. I'm not sure if this game actually simulates this, but there is um, really quite a lot of oxygen in comparison to other satellites or even other planets 
except for obviously Earth. Um, and the one thing we know about Europa is that it's covered in ice, and it's very, very possible that underneath this all this ice, there's actually uh, there's actually layers of liquid water, which kind of made us speculate that maybe there is life in there. And one of the reasons why there might be life underneath I underneath all this ice is because the water in there, even though even though the temperature is really, really cold here, the temperature is actually uh, currently minus 273. 3 Celsius, and it's probably a little bit less than that, but um, it's basically in, in the negative hundreds. And so even though the um, the surface is actually ice, underneath it, because of the tidal heating which we've discussed before, and this tidal heating would be the result of um, close proximity to Jupiter, actually maybe I should probably enable this, let's actually enable it right now, because this game did introduce this awesome feature called tidal heating, and it's right here, so I'm going to enable this. Uh, so basically, yeah, because of the tidal heating, uh, the water on the inside might be actually liquid, meaning that it's very possible that there might be some uh, some life underneath. And so actually NASA very recently announced that they had a plan to possibly send a submarine on this planet, which would be able to explore the uh, this, uh, the water underneath the ice on of Europa, which would be pretty awesome, especially if we did find some life on it. And the third Galilean moon is right here, and this is Ganymede. And this one is really interesting as well because, well, for one, it's actually the largest moon in the solar system, but it's not the densest. So even though it's actually larger than Mercury in size, it's at uh, its radius is about 2,600 kilometers, it is not as dense. So its uh, surface gravity is actually slightly lower than that. Um, but it, nevertheless, it's very interesting because for one, it's actually the only moon we know that has a magnetosphere, kind of like what Earth has, uh, and this is what protects us from dangerous solar radiation, especially the, the uh, charged particles from the sun. So things like um, things like northern and southern lights, or basically the aurora borealis that we see in the night sky, are the result of magnetosphere, and uh, it's um, it's something that. If we are with terraform Ganymede, we'll be able to observe it in there as well. And the reason why it might have um, the magnetosphere is possibly because it has a very active uh, liquid iron core with a lot of kind of convection, a lot of movement inside, which is why we think this is how it works on Earth as well. So this is a very interesting um, satellite and it's a very, very potential terraforming target for us in the future as well. And the last, uh, last satellite known as Galilean satellite is Callisto. Um, now here, this is actually a moon that's sort of farther away from the other moons and it's not, um, doesn't actually get the tidal effect from the other moons that orbit in that region. So it does get effects from the Jupiter, but not from the other moons. And, and the thing about Callisto is that it actually never had any geological activity. So its surface is covered in craters very similar to how our moon looks. So this is actually a very dotted kind of a planet or a satellite. Um, and it's essentially, I don't want to call it a dead satellite, but it does feel like it's a dead satellite that doesn't really have any activity on it. There's really very little except for craters on it. So there's no volcanic activity, there's no plate tectonics here. And size-wise, it's a little bit smaller than Ganymede, and Ganymede is actually the largest satellite we have. And this one is only about uh, 2400 kilometers in radius. Um, and also, so yeah, there's a really no activity on it. So this one might be actually the most difficult to terraform. But all in all, these are the four satellites we're going to try to terraform. We're going to terraform the four uh, Galilean uh, moons, Galilean satellites. The, the other ones, the, the ones on the periphery, also known as irregular satellites because of their orbit, um, they are much smaller and they're, they will be close to impossible to terraform. And also, uh, really, it's, it's all about these main ones, the four main ones. Uh, that are in a very specific orbit, very almost circular orbit around Jupiter. Now to do to do this terraforming, we're going to actually switch to a different mode. We're going to actually open the simulation of the solar system where we have all planets and all moons. So what this will give us is this. It will give us um, eight planets and each of them will have their respected, uh, respective satellites orbiting with them. The only problem here is that I will not be able to accelerate time too much because of the amount of different things in the solar system. So my, actually what I'm going to do is erase everything except for Jupiter and satellites and everything else will be gone because I just want to have Sun and Jupiter um, with its satellites orbiting around it. So say goodbye to Saturn and uh, the way to do this if you actually want to do this yourself is to hold control button and then to select this like this and basically erase it by with a delete button. Goodbye. 
and goodbye to you too and Mr. Uranus and all your jokes, goodbye to you as well. Uh, these ones are not as much of a concern to me, but I'm, I'm going to just uh, get rid of, I guess, Mars and possibly all of their other ones as well, because this will make me accelerate my game a little bit faster, because uh, otherwise the computer requirements to be able to accelerate your game with all of these satellites orbiting around Sun are quite, quite high. And even with this, I can only go as high as 20 hours per second, so that's actually quite low. Anyway, so let's actually zoom in on Jupiter and take a look at some of the things, including the temperature. Now you can see that the orbits don't look very, very circular. That, that's because it's currently orbiting around the sun. And when things orbit in such a way that um, there's a central um, central star and then also um, the, the planet with its satellites, its orbits... Uh, the patterns of the orbits look very, very, um, very interesting. So this is actually, they do orbit in a circular uh, fashion around Jupiter, but because of the um, orbit within the orbit, it actually looks like a wavy pattern. So if we were to stop this, um, if we were to stop this from showing, so if I were to turn off the trails, you'll see that it's actually, it's moving around in a kind of a circular fashion around Jupiter. Let's actually turn them back on because they're so pretty. And so yes, this is Jupiter with all of its satellites trailing behind, and we're going to be taking a look at the, uh, the Galilean moon, starting with the innermost, which is which is Io. So Io is right here, and it is qu going to be quite a challenge because first of all, it's a volcanic planet, so there's really nothing we can do about it in terms of um, trying to change its volcanic activity because. It's sort of in a position where both Jupiter and the other satellites, the other moons that orbit around um, Jupiter, really cause it to have such a huge tidal activity on the inside. And that could be a problem because um, even if we try to terraform it, it will still have quite a lot of volcanic activity. But hopefully in the future, in, uh, in you know thousands or possibly millions of years later, we'll be able to actually control it or even harvest it for energy. So I'm going to turn on the tidal heating here. And this will hopefully give us a little bit more realistic heat that uh, this planet experiences. And first things first, so we need to create atmosphere. And uh, since this is a volcanic planet, maybe we could use those volcanoes somehow to start blasting huge, huge amounts of atmosphere and start increasing uh, the amount of atmosphere that this planet has. Now, because this satellite seems to have no water in it, we may actually want to do two things. Either bring some of the water from the inner rings of Jupiter, and that is uh, basically by uh, collapsing them into uh, into the satellite. And this we could do with other ones as well. Or we could actually use some of these outer satellites, which might have some water in them, like for example, this one here, Megaclite. Um, let's actually take a look at it. Does it have any water in it? Okay, so in this game, none of these satellites have water in them, but uh, we know that some of the Jupiter satellites do have water, so we can actually uh, change their orbit so that they actually smack into Io and bring their water to it. So just for fun, let's launch something into it and that will actually both warm up the planet and also give it a little bit more material. So this is me smacking uh, Deimoses, which are satellites of Mars, into Io just to give it a little bit more material um, and a little bit more stuff uh, that it can use to create that water and so let's just say now it has some water in it and it also has some temperature and as you can see it started to acquire ice so this is the water that we brought it into it and now it became ice so we have some ice fields here we just need to warm up the planet now and this is something that it will be a little bit more challenging but possibly also a little bit more easier for Ayo at least and that's because of the volcanic activity. So as soon as the volcanoes start exploding and um, as long as there's atmosphere on it and as long as there is a little bit of uh, greenhouse effect, which I believe we do have right here. And I'm actually going to increase this a little bit just so it gets a little bit warmer. And here we go. So currently it has one atmosphere uh, surface pressure. It has quite a lot of atmosphere and it will hopefully start warming up. If it doesn't warm up enough, we may have to readjust some of the uh, features of the atmosphere. But right now it has water and it's just a little bit cold. So we're just going to wait for it to warm up while we go to the next satellite and do something similar to, to this. And now that I've accelerated time a little bit, you can see that the temperature has started to increase. It's already at 173 and it will, it will keep increasing because now it has a little bit of atmosphere or actually quite a lot of atmosphere and it also 
uh, has some tidal heating from Jupiter. Now let's zoom in on Europa. So Europa does have oxygen and ice, so it makes it a little bit easier for us, but it just it's very, very cold. So let's uh, let's start by warming it up. And to warm up, it will obviously need more oxygen. And this, this can be obviously uh, created from all this extra water that it already has. So if we can actually use an electrolysis process and release all this extra oxygen that's stored on it, we can create a huge atmosphere on it. And this can even be used to transfer some of the atmosphere to the other um, satellites that we're trying to uh, terraform. So let's let's go ahead and start increasing its, its uh, atmospheric mass. So now that it has atmosphere and a little bit of greenhouse, actually quite a lot of greenhouse effect, um, I also may actually need to incre decrease its albedo a little bit. It will be able to acquire the necessary heat and warmth to at least warm up a little bit and possibly uh, melt all of this ice and turn it into water. Now, once once this ice becomes water, its albedo will actually go down even more, giving it even more heat from all of the sunlight that it will be able to absorb. So let's wait for Europa as well, and meanwhile go to the next satellite. And here is Ganymede. So Ganymede needs quite a lot of work because it needs both the atmosphere and uh, water. So let's just smack a few things into it for fun, and also give it some water. This is how we would simulate uh, the water acquisition because it would have to come from um, comets or objects outside of Ganymede. And as soon as it gets water, you start seeing ice on the surface. And so now we just need to create atmosphere again. And let's go ahead and do this. And we know that right now Ganymede has very, very thin atmosphere, but it does have some oxygen on it. So that's a good start. Uh, and we can increase its surface temp surface pressure to about, let's just say, two atmospheres and see what how, how hot it gets afterwards. Uh, also, possibly decrease its albedo by throwing some dark materials onto it. And now we just wait for it to become a little bit warmer than this. And the Callisto is the last one, and it's probably the more difficult one because it is just very, very cold and uh, doesn't have any activity on it. So here we'll have to put some effort into it, possibly really throw things at it, uh, various moons, various satellites. I'm actually possibly going to smack Mimas into it because why not? Here comes Mimas. And this will give it some heat and also possibly some water materials that will, it will need to create that ice that we need. And here comes the ice that starts forming on the planet. We just need to give it some atmosphere now and it will start acquiring the necessary features to become terraformed. And as soon as I give it atmosphere, you can see that it actually starts having this glow around it. It's actually a very beautiful glow because of this uh, object that I just smacked into it. So this is actually the heating effect of this huge pool of lava. And because its albedo is already very low at 0.17 or 17%, we don't really need to worry about that. So we we'll just have to patiently wait for all of these planets to, uh, or all of these satellites to now warm up and become uh, quite pleasant and habitable for us. Now, I may have miscalculated with certain values, so we'll just have to uh, wait and see how hot and how warm they get. Some of them might be actually too hot and some of them might be actually still too cold. So we'll play around with these values once we wait for at least one of them to acquire a uh, temperature that's a little bit closer to zero degrees. And this will actually probably take us a few years. We have to wait a few actual years and you can see the date here. This is actually, it started at, uh, I believe, January 1st, 2014 and um, it's already August. So we'll wait a few years and see how warm they get. They currently still have temperature of minus 170 or even 180 degrees Celsius. So this will be the difficult part of basically just waiting and seeing what happens because unfortunately the maximum acceleration I can give this is one something, something just over one days per second, which is not actually enough, but uh, luckily, I'm just going to cut this part out. Alright, so actually, surprisingly, Europa is one of the first to warm up to uh, almost zero now. Look at that, it's uh, it's at minus seven. That's probably because I actually increased its atmosphere a little bit. I raised its atmosphere to 17 atmospheric pressures. But it's getting there. It's about to have its water melt. And unfortunately, there's some sort of a visual glitch here happening, but that's okay. And so we're, we're about to see what Europa is going to look like. Um, when it gets to a terraform-like stage. Now, here's the thing, um, there's actually quite a lot of discussion about whether we can survive high pressures. Um, and this is something that you actually learn when you, if you ever start scuba diving. Um, people, or actually really any mammals, can go to, hypothetically, go to any pressure. Like, you can actually go to really high depths 
hypothetically um, and not be squished, not be, uh, you know, destroyed by pressure because first of all, we, oh, here we go, it's turning into liquid. Uh, one of the reasons is because we are actually are consisting of liquid, like there's a lot of li liquid inside our body. And the other thing is that there's something called partial pressure, which means that all of the cavities in your body that have air in them, they um, they increase pressure as you go underwater. So um, you, inside your lungs, oh look, this is so beautiful. Oh no, it's still increasing temperature. This is possibly not good for us. I may need to decrease pressure now because I didn't expect it to get so hot. I want this to be around 15 degrees actually. So I'm going to play around with this value right here until it stabilizes a little bit. Okay, this is a little bit better. So this is actually now it's only for uh, atmospheric pressure. So look at that. Look how beautiful this is. The only problem with this obviously is that it's just all water. There's really, there's no land on it whatsoever. So this would be an ocean world where you can go for a vacation just if you want to, you know, live on a, on a boat and swim around. And the temperature is getting a little bit warmer, so it's going to be probably around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Um, so yeah, so um, partial pressure inside the air um, cavities in your body does increase as you go down. So if you go down to a depth of about 300 meters, which is actually currently the record, I believe, is like 327 meters or something. And it was actually set by an Egyptian um, in, uh, I think it was at the end of 2014. And... Uh, here's Callisto. Look at that. It's already warm too. I didn't even realize that. Oh no, it's actually it's really hot. And there's a the uh, area where I threw that um, satellite now is actually a lake or a sea. Uh, so okay, Callisto is a little bit too hot, so I need to decrease its atmospheric pressure as well. Okay, I think I stabilized the temperature. It's going to start going down now, and the atmospheric pressure here is three. I may have to increase it later, but. Uh, it's currently at 44 degrees Celsius, and we'll see how it goes afterwards. Look how beautiful this is. This has both land and uh, and oceans, and it even has a big lake from... It's, a, it's the area right here that you don't see right now. Uh, but it's from me smacking a big... Um, uh, it was satellite, actually. I think it was... Wasn't it Mimus? I think it was Mimus. I smacked Mimus into it, and now it has a lake in that place. Um, so yeah, the person who went uh, and beat the record was underwater for 15 hours and it was pressures of uh, close to maybe 35 atmospheres and he was fine. It's uh, the only problem that he had was coming it back up. So it actually took him a long, long, long time to come up because um, decreasing pressure inside is a lot more difficult than increasing. So, so you have to be very careful or basically you burst your lungs and everything else. Okay, this one is not getting anywhere. And that's because of the surface temperature. I don't know how it got so hot suddenly. Oh, oh, I think I may have overestimated the, the potentials of Io. It does get extremely hot, so this has to be much, much lower. And really, all of this temperature is increasing because, not because of the sun energy, but look at the tidal power that it's experiencing. It's really all because of the tides of Jupiter and other satellites. So Io is probably going to be the most challenging satellite because of the... the uh, really because of the high, ridiculously high amounts of temperature that um, it does get. So I'm, I'm gonna have to try to cool down it somehow. All right, so and Ganymede is still really cold, so I may have to work on Ganymede a little bit more, uh, possibly giving it a little bit more pressure as well. So we're, we're going to increase this to something around uh, 16 atmospheres and see how, how this uh, influences it, because it doesn't get enough tidal uh, pressure, but it does get more uh, sun um, sunlight because its size is much bigger, so it does get a little bit more sunlight. So hopefully this will get us to the necessary temperature that we need from it to survive on it. Um, but yeah, so far we have two that are completely terraformed and one that is a little bit too hot. We need to uh, cool this down a little bit. I'm going to actually uh, possibly increase its albedo and also give it a little bit less atmosphere just for now and here we go i think Ganymede is about to get terraformed too i did increase its atmosphere dramatically but i'm going to go back to what it was before now because it doesn't need that much uh, atmospheric pressure but i think eight atmospheric pressures which should be enough uh and so yeah th these are planets that we can easily survive on and just going back to earth from them might be a bit of a, a bit more challenging because we need to depressurize ourselves Otherwise, we'll experience something called the bands, which is basically a very, very painful and potentially deadly um, body 
hurting experience, for the lack of better words. It's essential. It's not a disease. It's not a sickness, even though it's called a sickness. But it's it's the experience that our body um, goes through when you you come from a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment. Okay, there we go. Everything's melted and the temperature is still increasing a little bit higher. And look at that, we have these green pastures, which is probably not pastures, but it looks green. Uh, and obviously blue oceans. So this is uh, probably the most Earth looking like uh, satellite or slash planet that we've achieved so far. And this looks really beautiful. It has continents, it has islands, it has a very large ocean. We'll give it a few more minutes to stabilize a little bit. Meanwhile, let's go back and see how Europa and Callisto are doing. So Europa is at 10 degrees Celsius. I think it's stabilized quite well. I'm going to zoom in on it just to see. And yep, it's just all water. This is a, an ocean world. And if we look at Callisto, Callisto is at 41 degrees Celsius. It's still going down actually, uh, because I did decrease its atmospheric pressure. But it does, it's looking pretty good. It does look really nice and habitable and uh, has a little bit less oceans, but we can't really do anything about that. I mean, we can add more water, but that's not necessary. Now, the one I'm still concerned about is Io. And because of the tidal pressures, uh, tidal um, heating it's experiencing, it's still really, really hot. So this is what I'm going to be working on for now, because I need to try to cool it down. And Io is being really stubborn. It actually won't decrease temperature. Um, I've actually completely eliminated the sun effect, so I've basically decreased its albedo or increased its albedo to one and uh, this means that it's not receiving any sun radiation right now and it's only getting tidal power, tidal heating. And even, the, even with that, its temperature is at 282 degrees. Let's see what happens if we remove the atmosphere completely, if this is zero. Will it actually cool down then? And looks like we were able to cool it down, but now I have to warm it up again. So this stabilizing IO is going to be a huge challenge because it is a very stubborn planet. It's getting so much tidal heating from Jupiter that it's actually almost 10 times as much as it's, uh, what it's getting from the sunlight. Um, so most of its energy, most of its heat is coming from uh, being uh, squished and squeezed and uh, twisted by Jupiter and by other satellites around it. Oh, looks like I'm getting to that necessary temperature. It's getting closer to it. It's about to have its all of its ice melted. And this was actually when I, res not restarted, but I basically I cooled down the IO first. I cooled down the entire satellite by remo removing all of the sun effects and solar effects and all of the atmosphere. And then once I started from uh, the cool IO, I was able to get to the point where it's about to get to zero degrees Celsius and currently it has exactly one atmosphere actually. This is what we have on Earth. So if everything goes right and if it actually stabilizes around um, 10 to 15 degrees Celsius or maybe 20 maximum, it might actually be the perfect satellite to live on. Uh, but chances are it's not going to be the case because the tidal power will most likely keep heating it up. So I may have to start playing around with some of these values until it has a stable temperature. And it's about to reach the melting point and we're about to see liquid oceans and lakes. And here we go. It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but these are actually turning blue because this is now liquid water. So it does have atmosphere, it has liquid water and the temperature is still kind of increasing. So I'm actually going to see um, how high it gets because I don't want it to get super hot again. But so far this is looking good. So you have a little bit of lakes, you have a little bit of smaller seas in there, no oceans unfortunately, but that's because that was by choice. And um, we're going to try to stabilize it so that it does look more Earth-like. All right, so even though I've decreased its atmospheric pressure to basically the lowest we as humans can live on, so this would be like in, in high mountains somewhere in, uh, not Himalayas, but sort of like, sort of like where uh, Tibet is and where Nepal is. So, you know, heights of about five to six kilometers. Uh, even even though I've decreased it to the lowest possible pressure, it's still its temperature is still increasing. So it's getting so much heat from Jupiter and from the other satellites just by orbiting around them that it may not be actually um, livable on. It, there's really unless we can actually replace its orbit and change its orbit somehow, it might be actually very difficult to turn this into an Earth-like planet because it looks like the tidal power which is actually ridiculously high on this planet or this satellite 
uh, will still make it really hot. We'll see how it goes, but so far it's looking like Earth, but I'm not sure if this is a stable temperature. So let's just take a look at them once again. So Io is right here. It's uh, 6 degrees Celsius right now and slowly increasing. Uh, it has a very uh, interesting surface with a lot of volcanic activity. This would be sort of like an extreme version of Hawaii, I guess. And then we have our water world, Europa, which is uh, a world where you go for a vacation of just water and nothing else. You can bring your own space boat and you can live on it, on it and uh, possibly go scuba diving and nothing else, do nothing else. Uh, but yes, this is a very beautiful uh, ocean world. Then we have our beautiful and large satellite called Ganymede, and this is the land of luscious forests and uh, a good mixture of land and water. There's actually about a 50-50 uh, ratio of water to land. So this is where you can actually have your little home and getaway vacation spot, or even live there possibly. And finally, uh, we have Callisto, which turned out to be a much easier terraforming project than I imagined. There's a really large Callisto ocean right here, and a very beautiful um, continent right next to it. So it's a very beautiful uh, island populated uh, satellite that has quite a lot of livable land and quite a lot of areas to explore. And basically that's it, that's it in a nutshell. This is how you terraform satellites and possibly in the next video, we're going to take a look at Saturn and its satellites as well. Thank you for watching, please subscribe and game you later alligators, bye bye.